two, one, we are live. All right, hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to the experience series where we talk to industry leaders about their personal journeys and the insights that can only be garnered from lived experience. The experience series is brought to you by The Hive and Hive Life Magazine. And of course, this is another online edition. So if you guys wanna get involved in the conversation, head over to the Experience News Facebook page and leave your questions in the comment section below. I am so excited to be able to speak to Laura Youngson today. So she is the co-founder of Equal Playing Field and Ida Sports. She is a very vocal STEM advocate, a TED speaker, and of course, a three-time Guinness World Record holder, which is super sick. I'm so excited to be speaking to you tonight. How are you, Laura? Yeah, very well. I'm really excited to be here as well. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. So what time is it over there for you again? So it's about 11 in the morning. So, you know, it's quite nice. You've just got up, well, got up earlier and then do a few things and then get to chat to you all. Yeah, so she is all the way in Amsterdam. I'm at the Hive Hong Kong. Normally you're in Melbourne, so you would have been at the Hive Collingwood. But here we are. We're, we're going to rock this interview remotely. So let's just dive right in. I'm really excited to get to the meat of what you, the amazing work that you guys do. Um, so could you speak a little bit about your background and tell the audience a bit about Equal Playing Field? Yeah, so um, I guess the, the interesting stuff is um, I'm originally from the UK and really enjoyed learning about how the world works. So I went off to study physics. That was kind of my, my first uh, passion is really understanding how the world works and had lots of different jobs and lots of different places the opportunities to travel around and experience loads of different cultures and um, a few years ago I had this cool idea to go climb Kilimanjaro and play a football match at the very top right. with all women so that was kind of the birth of equal playing field and that was um, really as well as climbing a mountain and having the challenge, it was more about showcasing what women can do um, and highlighting the fact that there are a lot of inequalities in sport when it comes to opportunities, training facilities, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, it was a pretty cool adventure. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I saw the photos and it just looked breathtaking. I mean, I can imagine that it was an extremely trialing journey up there, but could you actually talk a little bit about the, the women that you actually were able to get involved in this, um, in this journey? I, I remember you saying in your, in your TED talk that you had everyone from grassroots to professionals. So could you talk about how that came to be? Yeah, it was um, this, so one of the co-founders, Erin, is um, a good friend of mine and just about as crazy. So we embarked together to like ring people up from our network and, and kind of ask them, hey, do you want to do this thing? Like you're climbing a mountain, then you get to play 90 minutes of soccer. And yeah. everyone was kind of, oh, maybe, uh, that sounds really hard. But there like, are a few- Soccer sounds cool, but I don't know about the climbing the mountain bit. <laughs> exactly, like, oh, you know, there's potential for like, you know, it could be yeah. a bit a bit trialing. And so um, we ended up actually then finding these people that really were very passionate about what we were doing and um, from all across the world. So really, that was one of the most beautiful things of the trip is having getting to interact with players um, from all these different countries. Um, we had Jordanian players, Canadian players, uh, Deepa from Nepal, and just having this real mix of languages and experiences and cultures, but all with that shared love of football. Yeah. Um, and then having these players, so some players uh, like the players from Tanzania, they're grassroots players, but they'd never climb the mountain, obviously. So being able to climb with them in their home country and then players that had been to the World Cup and been to the Olympics and had these very different experiences as a professional um, and really looking at the commonalities of why why people love the game and, and also why they want to change it because um, it's just there's still a lot can be done with the game. I mean, can, I can imagine that having so many people from different backgrounds on this one journey, this one expedition, were there any, you know, conversations throughout that, that climb that sort of spoke to, oh, this is about women empowerment, or was it just more about like, you know what, we all love football, we're all here to do one thing, you know, what was that like? Interestingly, it was, it was definitely the former. So um, pretty much every conversation was about, okay, what experience have you had? Um, why, why are you climbing? So in, in a lot of cases, it's 
the parallels between climbing a mountain, which is a physical challenge, but also the fact that women climb these invisible mountains every day. So it's even, and it's kind of a small frustration. That was a lot of the thing that was uh, we were talking about. So it's like, ah, oh, you have to use the like leftover kit again. Ah, oh, and it doesn't fit. Or it's like, oh, well, we're not allowed to go on the first team pitch because maybe our women feet will damage it. And you're like, come on, like, yeah. it, is there that much difference? Um, and so there was a lot of discussion of like, oh, wow, that, yeah, that I've had that experience as well. And this is how I approached um, changing it or at the very least commiserating that you have yeah. the same experience. Oh, that's amazing. So obviously the most, I can only imagine what that moment would have been like when you guys reached the peak and you're like, oh God, okay, now we have to play an actual game of football. Like what was that celebration like? It was amazing. To be honest, it was, for me, it was incredible. I'd like visualize this moment if we're all standing there and we're waiting for kickoff. And when we, you climb up at the summit and we actually played in the crater that's just at the top of Kilimanjaro. And so you climb over the summit and you get to that point and you, we all took photos. We were like, yeah, we got to like the crater summit. Um, and yeah. then you step down into the crater and the team that was building the pitch had set off earlier than us. And so as we came down, you could actually see the pitch being kind of laid out. And at that point I was like, oh my goodness, we're actually gonna do this. Like, we've got all of our players, we've got a pitch. <gasps> this is like, this can really happen. Um, it was it's just amazing. Passion pitch, right? It was like this gigantic ash. It's, a, it's an ash volcano. So it's a, it's a dormant volcano. So you're playing in this kind of lava sand, uh, like ash, black ash. Yeah. Um, kind of like playing at the beach. We probably should have played beach football. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was that uh, heavy to like play in. But um, right. yeah, we went for the full 11 aside football instead. Yeah. So were there any moments on the way to the top where like the physical aspect of that journey kind of set in for anyone in particular and you guys had to like sort of rally together or was it sort of just everyone on the same sort of level all the way up it was it was harder than I think everyone anticipated and everyone I would say had a moment of when they were like oh this is this is not necessarily too much for me but it, it's tough yeah. and I think the good thing about going and traveling as a group is that everyone didn't have that same moment at the same time. Yeah. So if one person's having that moment, everyone else rallied around and were like, no, you can do this, you've got this. Um, we fixed a lot of injuries on the mountain as well, kind of some people had strained muscles. And so it was kind of in doubt whether they could walk even or uh, let alone play. And so everyone kind of rallied around to really protect that player and build them up so that then when someone else needed it, you could rally around them and kind of bring them up and make sure um, as many people as possible could could participate. And I think that was one of the, the best things about going as a group and going as a football team, a, that team aspect of really helping each other out. Absolutely, oh, that's amazing. Um, so, you know, that is obviously one of the accomplishments that won you guys the world record. In sport, yeah. Which I mean, cool. I, I saw in your TED talk that you said you used to watch Guinness World Records as a kid, right? And now you're we like, you actually want to test. So that's amazing. Um, yeah. so could you actually speak a little bit about what else Equal Playing Field has accomplished since then, um, including the Jordan Quest? Could you talk about that? Mm, so I think one of the things we realized, like it was never just about the world record. It's, I mean, it's super cool. And it is. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Awesome. But it was really using the world record to talk about all these other issues and talk about um, kind of like why we feel the need to go over and above and beyond to then just feel equal. Yeah. And so yeah. we used it as a conversation starter to raise some of these issues like, can we get more training facilities, better opportunities? I mean, pay is such, uh, there's such disparity that if you're a professional player, you're often working kind of two or three jobs yeah. uh, just to play this sport. Um, and I think there's a real um, kind of difference between kind of media rights and then what actually flows through to the women's game. So we used it as an opportunity to then start a conversation. And what we found is that was really resonating with people. Right. So being able to then, uh, we got invited to go, they were like, oh, well, you've played the highest, why don't you play the lowest? And we were like, yes. 
that would be brilliant. So then <laughs> Jordan, as well as playing a football match, we're able to, again, have this um, time to hike together and have these conversations and then um, engage with local communities as well um, to really um, look at the challenges, the structural challenges that are facing girls and women that want to play. So it's really become much bigger than just the kind of initial, hey, let's go climb a mountain, set a world record. And yeah. from, like now it's become this movement and there's a lot of people involved and um, really sharing their experiences and, and looking to improve things for their own organizations and their own countries. So yeah. it's been really cool. Um, yeah. yeah, and then last year doing the world record in France was, that was really tough. Oh, <laughs> Could you tell yeah. us a little bit about that, actually? I want the audience to be in on that. Yeah, so we played the world's biggest game. So we had the biggest five-side game. It went over four days. Um, we had 820 players rolling on, rolling off uh, continuously, even through the night. Um, but it was in the middle of this kind of once-in-a-decade heat wave. And right. so it made it incredibly challenging, sort of 45 yeah. degree um, heat for people to play. Um, it's a kind of change a lot of things during the, the game whilst it was going on. But again, it gave me an opportunity to share some of these stories of players, um, open the conversation about like equality, equality in, in sport. Um, and yeah, it was a, a really good expression. We had, uh, I think it was like, so we played a nationalities game and had 53 different nationalities participating in that game, which it's a, for me, it's such a cool expression of um, what we're doing, that yeah. diversity of player and experience um, and being able to share that together. Absolutely. So I remember reading something about Equal Playing Field and how, you know, you guys are not only fighting to, you know, fighting the stereotypes that are so firmly in place about women in sports, but you guys are also helping communities of women and girls. So could you speak a little bit about how you are a huge advocate for STEM education and for entrepreneurship. Yeah, so with Equal Playing Field, we've been able to help other coaches and organizations that um, want to deliver programs for girls. And often if there's a, an organization that perhaps has been already delivering programs for boys, we help um, kind of equip them with the skills that you need to then engage girls and, and really um, get that confidence boost. And I'm such a, a, a big fan of that you kind of that train the trainer. So you're training the people that are then making a massive difference um, in their own communities and and in the, like their footballing clubs and organizations. But because of my background in physics, I'm also like I love anything to do with STEM and kind of getting people interested and engaged in that science, science side of things, engineering, problem solving. How do you kind of become innovative and creative? Um, and so just on the side, do a lot of that kind of mentoring and really engaging different people in those, um, in those, uh, subjects and, and, and that kind of love for understanding how things work. Yeah. So that, that brings us to Ida Sports. Now, could you tell the audience about Ida Sports, what you guys have accomplished so far and how the mission has sort of evolved over time? Since it's yeah, so part of my journey on Kilimanjaro was I was chatting to a lot of the players and something that's always annoyed me is I have to wear kids boots when I play football because uh, yeah. I've got feet and um, chatting to a lot of these players realized that they too were wearing men's and kids shoes and these are kind of professional players they've been been to all these um, prestigious tournaments and I realized that potentially there's there's an issue here that like, why aren't people making women's boots and making them available? So um, went home, researched, realized that there are actually anatomical differences between men's and women's feet. And as women, we shouldn't be wearing uh, men's shoes. So um, went ahead and prototyped, developed the concept. And then essentially we've released our, our first product to the market uh, earlier this year. Right. So, um how are you guys? So obviously we did a high life interview with you about these amazing female football boots. So how are you guys working to obviously female football boots have existed in the past 
you guys are not claiming to be the first, but you guys are making it more accessible, working to make it more of a norm. So can you talk about how you guys are pushing that? Yeah, I think one of the things we've realized is that the market's it's a bit, it's really confusing. So as a consumer, um, at the moment, um, some brands might be making a football boot. Um, often it's pink, which uh, is fine, but a lot of the consumers don't really want that. Um, quite often it's also labeled as unisex. So it's um, actually meant for men because unisex is never for women. Um, yes. Or it's kind of, uh, it hasn't even been changed, but it's just marketed at women. So there's this really muddly kind of, um, space in the market and I think what we set out to do was really perfect this process of we're designing specifically for women so we're not even starting with a men's shoe we are literally we're starting with the the female foot we're designing with all the attributes for a female player so that we know having gone through this process that what we're releasing to the market is specifically made for women and that's based on all the science and the research and the journals and I think that for me is kind of what the market should be and it, we should have this choice as a as a female player you should have a choice to wear a really awesome kick-ass boot um and it's made for you and it's this performance footwear that kind of helps you improve your game um, and remove some of those barriers to you playing because i think there are a lot of there's a lot of research that we find that um fewer girls play sport and there's a lot tied up in like how you feel when you play sport and if equipment is one of those barriers then you're you're less likely to continue and you're less likely to to go further so um we know the benefits that sport brings when people play um so we want to be there to remove one of those barriers and kind of have something that's super comfy and you're just like mm, yeah i want to go wear that when i go and play yeah and that's exactly what you guys are doing with playing sports which is amazing so you, know, you talked about how you started in physics and obviously that informs on your passion with STEM and of course now with Ida Sports and getting it scientifically anatomically right for, for the female consumer. So how did this drive and love for sports and an active lifestyle come to be such a foundational part of your life? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. I think it goes back to childhood and I had a very active childhood. My parents very much encouraged us to play I have a brother we to play everything so as a kid growing up I think I tried pretty much every sport and I, I, every weekend was you know like mountain biking in the forest or um, making an obstacle course in the garden and just being being outdoors and being active and I think once you get the endorphins and get used to that um, kind of the highs from sport then you can't give it up uh, and it's and then you're seeking out ways that you can keep keep playing in some form and I think as an adult I've found um, football and other sports just amazing for making friends so you turn up at a, a new place and you join a team and maybe you can't speak the language but you can play together and then you learn a bit and you make some friends and it's just such a really cool cool way to engage with the world so I think I'm just such an advocate of getting out there and um, do something, find the something that you love and go go play it and, and enjoy it. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you, you, you sort of have these three areas of interest, one being science, one being sports, and another being sort of connecting with people all over the world. And you found a way to like pull all of that together and make a social impact, which I think a lot of people, that's why a lot of people are tuning in. I think it's because that's the dream, you know, you combine all your dreams and make it one big one that has a good impact on the world, which is amazing. I, yeah, it's, it's a really good, entrepreneurship is a really good way to bring together a lot of your passions. And then I think what I've been really like um, happy about is being able to find a commercial re like way to, to turn it into the thing that I do. Um, being able to produce products that people want and then build a business from that. And then you, you get to talk about sport all day. It's brilliant. Uh, you get to um, kind of innovate and be creative um, and push the boundaries and keep asking why. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that I really love that kind of like, well, why are we doing this? Um, why, why isn't it like that? And kind of unpicking what everyone's, um, what's the status quo and, and going, well, maybe we can change that because it, it's just been like that 
no one's really thought about why. Yeah, exactly. So that brings me perfectly to my next question. Um, how do your personal values and your past experiences inform your decisions in business? Because I know that Equal Playing Field, it's a wonderful organization that helps people, but Ida Sports is, is a business with a business model. So how do your experiences inform on the decisions you make? Yeah, it's a really good question because I think we set out with the business to have um, good, really good foundations and good values because you are chasing a profitable business, but you also don't want to do that at compromising certain things. So we take a lot of care with our materials, the materials that we use. We take a lot of care with the team and how we recruit people and how we work together. Um, and I think the having those values and even if you're so as a startup it's often quite hard to, to do that and everything's a bit of a trade-off but I think as well as being able to do it having the intention of where you want to get to is also really important so if you can't do it now at least be very explicit in where you want to be because I think as you go then along the journey it, it helps you when you have to make a decision over for example environmentally a, a particular material or other material it's better to and one is a slightly higher cost base well maybe that's actually the one that you should be using so being able to be aligned on like be very clear and then be aligned on your on your values really helps with the business decision making absolutely so you know it, would you say that it takes a lot of compromise every step of the way to kind of like scale but also adhere to your values at the same time um, on some things, yes, but on other things, it's like upfront something you can do. Um, even things like who we showcase as athletes, we do something called Women Crush Wednesdays on Instagram. So we, we showcase different athletes that we think are just doing awesome things. Um, and being able to um, represent lots of different groups of people, that's something we can do upfront. So players of color, um, players of different kind of LGBTI. There's so many people that we can showcase and it's it's that you can you can embed that straight away. That's a decision that you can do as a company. What yeah, what imagery you use, what photography you do. That's again something that you can as a small company you can do. Um, and there are bigger things that you can't do until you get to scale. But at, there are there is a lot that you can do. Um, and I think a lot that some of the bigger companies aren't doing yet that they probably could do. Yeah, that's a wonderful point. So um, could you tell us about an experience, whether it's with Ida Sports or with Eagle Playing Field, where, you know, you guys, your work personally impacted someone and you kind of had one of those moments where it's like, yeah, this is why we're doing this, you know? Could you, do you have one of those stories? I'm sure you do in your pocket. But. Yeah, for sure. I mean, with Eagle Playing Field, there's a ton of stories. So we'll, I mean, yeah. <laughs> With Ida, I think one of the big things for me, there's obviously a lot of hype and speculation when you're designing a product and you can right. do as much as you can. You do testing, you do prototyping, you get feedback sampling. But then the truth is really when people take the product, wear it and, and give you feedback. Yeah. And I think one of the most um, kind of big, one of the biggest moments for me was when we had a player um, come to us after they'd worn the boots and they were like, yeah, normally my feet, I get a lot of pain. Um, I'd say it's probably a nine or a 10 and I wore your boots and it was like a two on my left foot in pain and a zero on my right foot. And that was awesome. And I'm going to work on the left foot. And I was like, this is great. We've actually reduced someone's pain when they're playing. Like, I think I've been so focused on the product and like, okay, great. So we've made it comfy, but does it look good? Does it do all, sort of all the stuff around it? And then being brought back to this like, the person has had a less painful experience because of us. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, I mean, especially because you were someone who grew up loving sports and, and probably feeling a lot of the pain that she was talking about. The fact that you were able to, to sort of get rid of that experience for someone else and now it's spreading, that's amazing. So um, obviously we're talking about an industry that is a lot more mindful of its, of its male counterparts than it is of its female. So could you talk about how being in a male dominated industry, were there times when you felt discouraged? And if you did, how did you kind of push through that? Whether that's as a businesswoman or even as a sports enthusiast when you were younger? Yeah, I think 
I mean, one of the biggest challenges we've faced is that initially um, the, the insight that we've had that women and men's feet are different and that you need to actually shoes for you. Um, a lot of the bigger brands are still making unisex shoes or um, making them for men and marketing them to women. And for us, I mean, I spent a lot of time being like, I think I'm crazy. Like, that, like this isn't right. Like what I'm reading in the medical journals and what I'm seeing in the marketing is completely different. And so I even had a lot of people um, from within the industry tell me that I'm completely wrong. Uh, and I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm sure I'm right because the revolution we've seen in running hasn't happened in football and some That's of so true. Yeah. Very true. So I think, so about a year ago, we started to see that messaging change. Um, and that was kind of really nice for me because I was like, oh, I'm not crazy. Uh, well, I knew it wasn't, but validated by external people of seeing yeah. what they're, they're seeing. Um, and so knowing that in some ways being, you have to be really strong and true to yourself. Yeah. if you know you're right and know and like back it up with evidence and went out and found more evidence and and kind of did that until we were very certain that we were right and even though this industry is saying no women can just wear what men wear we knew that they can't so um that's kind of tough like having the continual feedback around you saying saying that the other thing that I find quite fascinating with what we're doing is um I quite often get told that oh yeah but you're making like Oh, your customers are niche and so i was like women yeah yeah <laughs> women and you're like okay so again half the population uh i know half the population doesn't play sport but it's still not niche yeah um, that's quite that, a lot of us play sport. Yeah. Uh, that must be exactly the kind of blatant frustration you have to face in this industry all the time where it's like you guys are not a small group of women. And, and that's the cool thing about what you guys are doing with Equal Playing Field is like, you're showing you're not only a small group, but you're, you're a huge group of very capable athletes and active people. So that's what's really cool about how those two mesh together. So um, in hindsight, you know, do you, do you have anything that you would, would have done differently looking back where you're at now? Um so many things but I think I don't have any regrets so I think the main thing we've been able to do is learn from different mistakes that we've made and I feel like part of the journey is you have to make those mistakes because it builds your foundations even stronger yeah. um so even things like we ran a, a crowdfunding campaign and we raised some of our target but we didn't raise the full amount so we decided to refund everyone and at that point, it was pretty low point. So like, ah, oh, it's we know we kind of have a market, but we haven't fully validated it. So we kind of went back to the drawing board, spent another year on the product, and really made it something that was top quality and, and really improved upon it. And that learning, whilst it was frustrating at the time, you're like, oh, I wish this had worked. It actually meant that we've come out with a better product, a better team, all of the things that you can improve upon. And we know exactly why it failed. So we did all the analysis and really understood it. So I think it would be um, worse if you if you don't know why something's happened, but often there's a attributable reason and then you go, okay, I understand why that is. I've learned from it and now I'm not gonna do that again. So that's that's where your science background really kicks in, right? It's it just, it comes out where anytime someone tries to refute your argument, you can come back and be like, this is the data, this is the facts that you looked into. So that's amazing. Um, sorry, I just want to remind everyone who's tuning in right now, we are almost at the end of the interview section. So if you guys want to ask any of your own questions, head over to the Experience Series Facebook page and leave your questions in the comment section below. And we will definitely include that in our interview. So next question. Um, you know, what would you say is the, is the biggest mistake that you've made in business? Now, I ask you this question only because I, I know that you're not in a niche market at all, but there are not a lot of women who are doing what you're doing. So what's the biggest mistake that you've made and how did you and what did you learn from it? Oh, good question. Um, I think we yeah. have. We've made lots of little mistakes, what I call mistakes along the way, but I probably would call them learnings. Yeah. Um, there's nothing that, there's been nothing that's you're kind of like, oh, this is a game changer. We're, we're out of the game um, yeah. because of this. I think there's just lots of things where you 
like you said before, with hindsight, you'd probably go, oh, I'd do that a bit differently. Um, but I think the big, big thing that we, we look at now is like the, we have the confidence in our products. Um, and I think that uncertainty phase, there's, I think that part of the difference is uh, between men and women is kind of backing yourself from the very get go and having that confidence to kind of push it forward. Yeah. So I think we, we believe in our product. I think we need to tell people more ne- like now we're starting to do it but I think originally I could have believed in myself a bit more about what I was capable of and I think climbing Kilimanjaro and organizing that trip really showed me that I have these these capabilities and can do it and so um backing myself to like succeed in those situations is now it's it's very that's very much my mindset whereas before it was supposed to be oh yeah you know you're being quite humble yeah oh, maybe yeah. maybe you can Whereas now it's like, no, we've definitely got this. Yeah. Let's You're like, I've got three Guinness World Records and like connected all these women from different countries. You guys are accomplishing amazing things. So that's definitely valid. Um, so you're, you know, a four-time founder. Do you have any general tips for budding entrepreneurs? You've talked about how um, there's certain things that smaller companies can do that bigger companies can. So in general, as an entrepreneur, do you have any tips for people out there? Yeah, so I think as um, found as startup founders, you can be very agile, mm-hmm. and so you can respond quite quickly to different scenarios. So, like for coronavirus, we had to pivot quite rapidly in what we were doing and how we used our resources, and we were able to do that within kind of a couple of days because um, you you just have this very agile team. But I think um, one of the things I often say to people is that entrepreneurship doesn't have to be an either or choice it's kind of a continuum so if you're like dipping your toe into being an entrepreneur then there's so much stuff you can do to test whether your idea is going to work and whether you've got um, a market for it like from even simple things like facebook ads asking people if they want to buy your product that kind of stuff which is not a big outlay before you go and like manufacture it kind of a widget that costs loads of money there's lots of stuff you can do that removes the risk um, of being an entrepreneur and you can keep doing your job on the side and in fact quite often entrepreneurs that I know that um, are building things they'll have a bit of a part-time job and do do their entrepreneuring um, and if at some point it'll tip you one way or the other and you'll either um, kind of go back to being a bit of an entrepreneur um, and yeah. so you've got all these skills and but you actually want to stay in corporate and kind of change things that way or you'll just like tip head first into entrepreneurship and then make yourself unemployable and never go back right i love that so um do you have any advice for women who are tackling any male-dominated industry yeah i think um finding your allies so there's really good groups of um and networks of female um support women supporting women uh, but there are also lots of really good um kind of men supporting women um you've got to find the right ones and not to be disheartened by uh someone like oh you're you're in a niche customer segment yeah. women uh those people okay we well, can listen to them but probably don't give them too much of your time um yeah. Because it because it is harder. Um, I think you have to justify yourself more. You have to get more data. You have to get more evidence to be taken seriously at the same same time. But if it's an idea worth pursuing, then it's worth pursuing, and you'll find the people that understand that you're ahead of the curve. And I think then you'll see everyone else start to cotton on afterwards. Um, so it can be isolating. So try and find that network of people that can. Um, sense check your idea and and support you like we were supported on the mountain support you when you're having those moments you're like ah this is not going to work and then they pick you up and go yeah it will you can do it Um, you need some of that in your in your day-to-day life in all your endeavors totally get yourself some mentors i love a good mentor um they just give you a really good perspective and, and different ways to think about what you're doing and whether you're doing kind of the right thing and in the right way and in the most efficient way like prioritizing and not getting distracted by other things so do you kind of see so i imagine that you you've already kind of started mentoring some of the women that you you met do you see your career kind of heading towards that direction even more mentorship um the entrepreneurship community is very much a pay it forward community so 
I, at any one time, will be getting mentored by someone and mentoring someone else. And I kind of feel that that's your good karma, like, um, exchange. So you might need to take a little bit from some people now, but you should be giving it to someone else in, in the future um, if you can't right now. So having these, um, yeah, I, if people ask for help, we always help them. Um, we have lots of interns and work experience. We offer those opportunities because it is hard sometimes to get your foot in the door. Um, and I, I love talking to ninjas. I call them like, sorry, mentors, but I call them ninjas because they're the people that kick down the doors for you so that you can walk through them. Yeah, often, that. that's just the, you might not be able to get into those rooms that are still like white male dominated. Um, so if you've got a ninja kicking down the door, then you can be like, I, mean, I can tell yeah. my story now. Um, and that, that really helps. So I think the other thing about mentoring is when you're mentoring someone else, you learn so much about yourself and about what your um, experiences have taught you. So I think it's a really valuable thing. Just like, yeah, mentoring everywhere. Do that. It's great. Mentors all around. That's awesome. That's cool. Um, that brings me to my, my last question, but we're going to be moving on to the audience questions next. Um, so what's next for you? I know that right now you are in Amsterdam. Uh, so can you tell the audience a little bit about that? Why are you there and what's the plan? Yeah, so we, we saw Ida set up in Australia and we realized, um, and that's going pretty well. Um, we're selling boots into the market and reaching a lot of players. <laughs> and we also know that there are um, big markets in Europe, the Premier League in the UK and the WSL, which is the English League for women, is really strong, obviously, uh, when it restarts because everything's been on hold. But then right. also the US, we've had a lot of interest there. So I've come over to Europe to really start building those networks and set up the business here to be able to service those markets as well. Um, so exciting. Yeah, it's really cool. And then equal playing field wise, we, we actually decided to take a year off. So it's been a very kind of good year to take a year off um, and just, just breathe and enjoy the fact that we've got these world records and yeah. talk to the people that we've connected and kind of find out what they're interested in. Yeah, um, I can imagine that the community is still really well connected from those amazing experiences, right? Yeah, it is. And we've got, um, our third Killiversary, we call it, um, is coming up on June the 24th. So we all have a little, um, some photos and videos of like three years ago, what we were doing and having that, that wonderful experience. Um, it's coming up this month, the 24th of this month. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Um, it's so great just kind of reminiscing about, oh, do you remember that time that this happened? And um, just, I'm still in awe that we managed to do it. Sometimes I look at it, I'm like, how? How on earth did we? Um, even managed to get enough players to the top of a mountain to play 90 minutes of football and yeah it's it's just a wonderful thing so yeah that's it's nice to have that moment to celebrate what has been achieved as well before looking at the maps for the next one yeah absolutely all right so i mean that brings us to the end of our interview portion i actually have some crowdsource questions from our hive members here and some of our hive staff so i'm going to dive right in um what would you say has been the scariest event or moment in your career and how did you overcome it so that could be climbing a mountain or something a little bit more office like what would you say has been the scariest moment oh scary um well, there's always the scary part of like not knowing whether something's going to work. But I think um, I had quite a formative experience. I used to run a hotel in Mozambique and um, it was in the middle of nowhere. We're three hours from the nearest city um, and it required a lot of thinking um, and problem solving in a very, yeah, very difficult way. There's a lot happened, things like... Um, is, I mean, reasonably dangerous. I know you had a spider there before. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It was snakes and, and um, lots of, in a different culture and, and lots of um, challenging problems like the car would break down and in the middle of nowhere and how do you dig it out and fix it and, and get it back. And so- Fear of the unfamiliar, right? Just being in a place and a situation that you're like, I don't know what to expect next. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's one memory that really sticks out, which is uh, I had to go and pick up a tractor uh, for a variety of reasons and um, 
technically have never driven a tractor, but everyone was like, oh, so you can pick up the tractor. And I was like, yeah, I'll pick up the tractor. Don't worry. Um, and so when I got there, sort of chatting to someone, and they, I was like, oh, well, if you just do the reversing and, and watching how they, like, the gears work and everything. And I was like, okay, cool. Just the seat, put it into the gear, and off we go. So then I drove a tractor 35 kilometers back to where it needed to be. Um, technically the first time I'd driven a tractor, but it, it worked out fine. Um, and so that you have these moments of like, oh, can I challenge myself? Okay, I'm just gonna do it. It's all gonna work out. And I feel like that's um, the entrepreneurial journey now is like, oh, are we gonna do this? Oh yeah, let's go for it. Um, and more often than not, it works out. And if not, you learn stuff. Right. So did you drive this tractor before or after you climbed the Dormy volcano? Was this before? This is actually before. Um, <laughs> And I think so that was a little bit scarier than climbing the, the mountain. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> was awesome. I, like I said before, like, because you have this beautiful team, um, yeah. I never really thought we weren't going to do it. It was just, yeah. it was such a good vibe, such a good, everyone had kind of gelled together. It was like, yeah. nah, we got this, we got this. Driving a tractor alone, I would imagine, is a terrifying thing. But that's yeah, why. I see. Yeah. Had a couple of people um we went with they carried on drove them to the particular village and then carried on it was yeah definitely a, a life-changing moment yeah i love that that definitely fits into the experience series aspect of this whole thing so that's amazing all right uh next question um so we have a member asking are you often met with sexism in your line of work if you do does it get to you and what kind of sexism are you often faced with um, is it like over or yeah, is it yeah. yeah, it's it doesn't. I know I was joking before about the someone say, or I've had it a couple of times actually, people saying that we have a niche customer segment of women, and that kind of overt sexism is is a lot rarer. I think the thing that's difficult is when it's kind of an undercurrent of that. So if we'll be in a business meeting and my co founder Ben, um, it might be that somebody will would sort of start talking and then they'll they'll just be looking at Ben and talking to Ben and I'm like oh, I'm here. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> so um he's very good at kind of redirecting the conversation and we're very conscious of it. Um and it does work the other way um with um if we're in women meetings with other women perhaps then they'll focus on me. And so we we do our best and this is kind of what I was saying with being a small company, you can set those values straight away. And yeah. so we we explicitly talk about it a lot and we when we work out um kind of how we can improve that culture already yeah. um but yeah it's sometimes frustrating um but it also it means you end up then work, relying more on your customers so i think that's a really good thing so especially in business and um also with equal playing field listening to the people who are using your products right and so if they are happy then you've got a really good business um and it doesn't really matter what other people say so investors or i i'm not an expert but i get quite a lot is someone telling me about yeah. Yeah. Right. you must be like well i am so sit down <laughs> yeah. so yeah. i think i spend a lot every time that happens i spend a lot more time listening to the customers and right. um, I, I value their opinion more than I value some of the other opinions. Um, and if they're happy, then we're happy. Brilliant, yeah. So I guess that's what you were talking about by male Alex. You know, it sounds like the co-founder of Ida is exactly that, where he'll sort of notice when things aren't equal and he'll sort of shift it to you and you'll do the same back, which is amazing, I think. Yeah, it's that's really nice. quality is, right? Yeah. It's nice having that. Um, diversity of thought and opinion as well. I think that's what makes it really strong. Yeah, it's kind of like on a macro level, it's it's equality, but on a micro level, it's just buddies looking out for each other in business, which is amazing. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. Awesome. All right. The next question is: What are your thoughts on the gender pay gap between women and men in in professional football? Man, it's. I just think it's a bit obscene the amount that some people can earn and then the fact that you're as a professional in the women's game you're not always you're having to work another job I think um when I found out some of the salaries of professional players I was like 
this is a joke. No one would want to play professional football as a female. Um, and I think um, there's an argument that you have media rights and there's not as much popularity, but I think it's a bit disingenuous, like looking at the World Cup and looking at the figures of people that watch the USA match, the England match, there is a market for it. People are wanting to watch it. So then um, how, what can we do about it? And I think one of the biggest things I saw, or like someone I um, was listening to last year talks about the return on investment and you can't get a return on investment unless you have investment. Yeah, absolutely. It's like the chicken leg, yeah. yeah. I think we need to overinvest to like build the game up and then you'll see all these benefits with like, if you're allowed to train uh, as a professional, then of course your game is going to get faster and stronger and better. If you're, um, if you've got the support system around you, physios, podiatrists, nutritionists, then of course the whole club is going to get better. And I think we're starting to see it, um, but it's still not at the like level that I think it deserves because it's a super cool game. And as we know, people are tuning in to watch it. So um, I think more can be done um, and, I think it's such a cool, it's a cool game. It's a cool space to be in and it's inspiring so many other women and girls that it's, yeah, it needs that. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's really cool that you are playing a role in, in that. Yeah, it's awesome. Right, right. Little small steps, but it, I think that's it. Like yeah. you need people to just stand up and say, this isn't right and maybe we can change it. And then other people come in as well and um, lend their voices and you join together and, and start to change things. Absolutely. All right, so it brings us to our last question. It is, do you have any plans to bring another world record in the near future? And if, if, if you do, what would that be? Like, do you, do you have any idea of what that might be? Um, I always have plans to do world records, but I have to kind of tone it down in between all the other things. Um, I, so I love the team aspect of world records because I was thinking about this a lot. Like you can do individual world records, but it really, that doesn't excite me in the same way as it is to have like a team come together and do something incredibly challenging. So I know France was really warm. So I was looking at maybe we could do a really cold game. That would be kind of cool. Like somewhere extreme, somewhere you have to like work hard to get to. Um, but I think and Antarctica, is that what you're saying? I know, that would be amazing. Um, <laughs> it would be super cool. So we're looking at, we are looking at some of the research that can be done um, around women as well. Cause it, I don't know if you know, but when we're on Kilimanjaro, we did a study around high altitude because there's very limited um, knowledge about women at high altitude and extreme um, environments and our doctor was from NASA so he was able to like feedback some of that the, the data in the reports so it'd be cool to do something like that and and continue to contribute to the research body but yeah. as well as doing fun world records it'd be amazing that is amazing Laura seriously so cool to hear more about your story and on that note I am so happy that I got to talk to you more about the amazing experiences you've had. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in to speak to Laura Youngson today. We've had an amazing time being able to talk to you. I hope you had a great time. And um, anyone who would like to tune in to another edition of the Experience Series, please like and subscribe to the Experience Series Facebook page, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Laura. Have a great Thank day. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Bye.